Just sit down? Okay, I'll just sit down. <laughs> It is good to see each of you this morning. We're glad that you've joined us for worship here in the auditorium with us, or if you've joined us by live stream, it's good to, to have you with us as well. It's also good to have guests worshiping with us today. We know we have several, and if you are a guest, we are glad that you're here and hope that you'll come back anytime you have the opportunity. And if you are a guest, we hope you'll tear off the little welcome side that's on the bulletin, and if you don't mind placing it in the offering plate later in the service, that way we'll have a record of your attendance with us today. I hope you've been looking at the screen or, or can hear me now. We've got several things coming up that, that we want you to take special attention to. Of course, this morning is our Christmas child shoebox, and we'll be taking that up. Any children or youth can participate in that, and. We'll just, during the welcome of guests, if the children and youth will go, the youth are supposed to be down here and the children in the back, that will help us out. But that'll be a little bit later in the service. And then uh, you see, of course, choir this afternoon at 5 in our service tonight. We invite you back for that. Back on track this week after the election, the kids will be in school, so we'll have Good News Club. and. We could still use some workers for that. If you would like to help us, you can see me. Then Wednesday night schedule with Team Kid and the workers meeting and the youth and prayer meeting. There's a, a place for everybody on Wednesday nights. Uh, several things coming up. We're getting close to Thanksgiving. Of course, the Sunday before Thanksgiving on the 20th is our churchwide Thanksgiving supper. The church provides the turkey and dressing, and if you'll bring all the other goodies to go with it, vegetables, desserts, and salads, but that'll be at five o'clock. And starting on that Sunday, all evening services through the month of January will be at five o'clock. Worship, everything will start at five, so just take note of that. Then the following Sunday on the 27th begins our Family Promise Host Week. If you're interested in helping with that, you can see Rusty uh, Hutto does the host and hostesses for that, and then Rob takes care of the food, Rob, Whit uh, Rob Williamson, so you can see him for that. But we need volunteers to help. And then also that Sunday night is Hanging of the Green, and I can't believe I'm already announcing that. The first Sunday after Thanksgiving is our Hanging of the Green service. And it begins at 5 o'clock. We'll be getting more information about all the events taking place that day. So we hope you'll be involved in that. And we hope to be able to have the tasting tea or the taste of Christmas that night following. We're still trying to, since Family Promise is here, work that out. But uh, just be mindful of all the things that are going on, the different ways that you can plug in to the events that are taking place and the opportunities of ministry we have. Also in the bulletin is the prayer list, those who are sick at home in the hospital or the missionaries needing prayer. But be reminded of these in our country at this time, our nation, uh, just that we'll still get on track following the election and that, that God will continue to be with us. We don't need to, to stop our praying now, but we can continue that on as well. But let's just go to the Lord now in a time of intercessory prayer. Good morning. Today is the day. The Lord I will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's stand and sing this morning. Today is the day you 
you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it Today is the day you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it And I won't worry about tomorrow I'm trusting in what you say Today is the day Today is the day Sing that again Today is the day you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it Today is the day you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it And I won't worry about tomorrow I'm trusting in what you say Today is the day Today is the day What have I to dread? What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms I have blessed peace with my Lord so near Leaning on the everlasting arms Today is the day you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it Today is the day you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it And I won't worry about tomorrow Trusting in what you say Today is the day Today is the day Anything's about tomorrow I don't seem to understand But I know Today is the day that the Lord has made. I'll trust what you say and give you the praise. And our Heavenly Father, we're grateful this morning for the opportunity to gather and worship you. The privilege we have of just being able to be a part of this new day is is something worth just being grateful for. The Lord, as we've gathered to worship, it's even more special because together we want our voices to be lifted to you in thanksgiving for all you've done for us. And for each of us here today, there's something different and special maybe that we have for which to be thankful. But we praise you and thank you for all of it. And for the opportunity is we'll be taking up Christmas boxes in a few moments. That opportunity to reach out to a world in need, even in this manner. The Lord help us to realize that every day of our lives there's a world about us that needs you. And you've placed us wherever we are for a purpose. That our life can be a blessing to others even as you've blessed us. And that we can share the good news of what you mean to us with those about us. Help us never to forget that and to always be ready to share our faith with those who are about us because Lord whether it's around the world or here at home everybody needs to know you and I pray that we'll be messengers of that good news to a world in need so just speak to our hearts in this time of worship accept our praise and thanksgiving and may we be able to go forth from this place saying it was good to have been in the house of the Lord for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's continue. I am thine, O Lord. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I long to arms of 
It is good to see you here this morning as we've gathered to worship, and it's a beautiful day. I know we could still stand some rain, and we need to pray for that rain because we're lacking in it around here, well, actually around the entire state, but we're glad you're here, and uh, we're going to welcome one another to the Lord's house, maybe get to see somebody you haven't already had an opportunity to say good morning to, and during our time of welcome, if you are a, a well, first grader all the way up through uh, high school, Oh, we got all of them in here. Okay. All right. I, I knew maybe nursery might not be in here. All right. But all from high school down who are here. All righty. Go toward the back during the time of welcome as we stand and greet each other. We're sorry.
the Jesus name above all names. There he is. Go do it. that will go to children all around the world. If you didn't have an opportunity to do one, uh, I don't think we have any more empty boxes here, but we may can get something. So see me if you have any questions or would like to do one. We'll take them to uh, Fair Park one day this week. Monday? Oh, we're taking them tomorrow morning? Oh, say the... Okay, okay, so bring it any time this week and, and it can be taken over there. And then all these boxes will go to Dallas and be put with thousands and thousands of more boxes that will be joined together and sent all over the world. And it takes about six months for them to get them delivered. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. They don't just pull up to a village and children come running and getting them. They already have a list of how many are going to be there at whatever their location is to give them out and the children come to that those who are on the list so they know exactly how many boxes are going each place and of course that is also according to the number of boxes given but it's a wonderful ministry each box the children they have a course that they will be going through about God and about God's love for them and many not just the children but their parents and families come to know Christ during this so the it's a gift to them but the main gift is Jesus Christ and so as we're giving them pray for the boxes and where they go God already knows exactly exactly where they're going and just the the quick story of to know that is there was one place where when they took the name of the children's that going to be there there were twins and one of the twin wasn't there and didn't think she was going to be there so they didn't have her on the list. Well, the day they delivered the boxes, she happened to come. Well, they were one box short. Isn't that horrible? Y'all know how that is. If you have somebody come up and you don't have something for them. So she and her sister had to share the same box. Everything in the box, there were two of them. Somebody, everything they put in the box, they put two. You think God isn't in this? But our children and youth are going to be doing this. The, the children packed them uh, Wednesday night during the uh, team kid time. Christy and Susan and Matthew and Miss Luna and Dwayne work with that. And they pack boxes. Our youth are helping. Others have packed boxes. And, and just think about what's taking place as we're giving these to the Lord, OK? Y'all can start.
we will get these counted, and uh, that'll be in our mail out this week, how many we actually have gathered uh, today. I can tell you by looking at the stack, it's more than we've ever had before. Uh, we already had 102 up here before these were brought down this morning that, that were already packed this past Sunday and uh, brought in. So we can be grateful for that. Let's bow together in a prayer of thanksgiving. Father, we thank you, not only for the labor of love that's gone into the preparing of these boxes to bring today, but also for that which you're going to do in carrying these boxes to the places they need to go. And already you know where they're going to go. And you know who's going to receive them. And our prayer is that you're going to take this effort of love to glorify your name and to bring about the salvation of people all around our world. And we know that even today in thousands of churches throughout our nation, people are gathering boxes just like this. And as this effort is, is so united, I just pray that, that the word of God will go out in a united way to those who need to hear it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus is Savior and Lord of my life, my hope, my glory, my all. Wonderful Master in joy and in strife, on Him you too. Jesus is Lord of all, Jesus is Lord of all, Lord of my thoughts and my service each day, Jesus is Lord of all. Blessed Redeemer, our glorious King, worthy of reverence I pay. Tribute and praises I joyfully bring to Him the life away. Jesus is Lord of all, Jesus is Lord of all, Lord of my thoughts and my service each day, Jesus is Lord of all. Will you surrender? deacons come forward for the morning offering we're certainly thankful for what God's blessed us with and the opportunity to give back a portion and James Shelton was going to lead us in a prayer Father God we come to you this morning we thankful for 
every, each and everything, God, that you've given us. Lord, we, we just strive to make you Lord of all. And uh, we just pray that you'd be with us in this service today. Be with Brother Smith as he brings the message of revival. Lord, we just pray that you we give back a little bit that uh, you've given us to, to continue your world. Lord, we just thank you for all you do for us and for all you're going to do. And we give you all the praise and the glory for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. It all starts with just one voice That takes a stand That makes a choice To live for God And not hesitate To tell the world about amazing grace Someone's already counted and said we've got 155 at this point. All right, usually we have a few others brought in during this week, and if so, we'll add those so certainly to it. Open your Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. I'm only going to read one verse from this as we think about turning the world right side up. 
We have faced an election this week that uh, uh, turned a lot of people's thoughts upside down or right side up or whatever, as uh, the outcome of that was nothing what the, the uh, political pundits were telling us were going to take place. I was sharing with, and, and we were talking about it a little earlier, how at about 12.30 uh, that morning, uh, rather than is there a path that Trump can win, I heard one of the commentators say to the other, maybe the question we need to be asking now, is there a path that Hillary can win? And they were looking at the remaining states that were available, and, and certainly it surprised and shocked many uh, in that. But what I'm talking about is not a presidential election because even though we pray for our president, even the one that's still there now, and, and the Bible commends us to, uh, to pray for those who are in authority, we pray that they will be successful because the success of those who lead in that area is important for the rest of the nation. What we need to be praying for is for we who are God's children to truly do what God wants us to do because the change that needs to be brought about, not only in our land, but in the world, is only that which God's people can do. It's not going to come, as one person said, from the White House. It needs to be from the church house. But in, John, in Acts 17, verse 6, we find, and, But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. In the city of Thessalonica, the opponents of the Christians called them the people who have turned the world upside down. Now this statement accurately describes what those first Christians did because they literally changed the, the world in which they were living for the cause of Christ. And, and it continued to change until in 320 A.D., Constantine was the emperor of the Roman Empire and uh, the it, and the Christian religion was declared to be the religion of the world. From a small beginning to 320 A.D., a growing movement of God's people sharing the gospel of Jesus with others till that point it was declared to be the religion of the world. They literally turned the world upside down. Now what these followers of Christ actually did, though, was turn the world right side up, wasn't it? Not upside down, but right side up. Because when you're doing things God's way, you're doing it the right way. And they were turning things into a godly way. Where there was darkness, there was now light. Where there was hatred, there was now love. Where there had been sadness, there was now laughter. Where there was chaos, they brought leadership. Where there was bondage, they brought liberation. Where there was death, they brought life. They took the world that was tired, troubled, tangled, and they turned it right side up. They put the world back on its feet, so to speak. And that's the challenge before us today. Our world, like the world of the first century, is tired and troubled and tangled. Our world, like that of the first century, is characterized by darkness and hatred and sadness and chaos and bondage and death. And our responsibility as Christians is to put the world right side up, back on its feet for Jesus Christ. But how are we going to do that? The basic answer is that, uh, is that we must do it individually. It's not going to be done, as I said, by our, our political leaders. It's not going to be done by some organization. Uh, confrontational efforts are as likely to drive people away from Christ as to bring them to Christ. The key is what we do as individuals and how we live as individuals for Christ. We must live in such a way as that our lives make a difference in the world in which we live. In the lives of those early Christians, there were three key ingredients, I believe, that enabled them to turn their world right side up. And those are the three blanks that you have there on, your back, on the back of your bulletin to fill in. The first of those is integrity. Integrity. That's the first key ingredient, integrity. The world in which Christianity was conceived was a world of incomparable immorality. Slavery was a universally accepted system. Homosexuality was running rampant. Uh, sexual permissiveness 
was the rule of the day. Dishonesty was standard operating procedure. Human life was cheap. Pleasure was life's primary pursuit. It was a world very much like the world in which we're living today. And into that world of immorality, Christianity introduced a new element, and that was integrity. This integrity, which was at the heart of the Christian faith, was like a breath of fresh air in the Roman world of that day. A letter to Diogenes in the middle of the second century indicates how revolutionary this idea was. The letter marveled that the Christians, and I quote, have their meals in common, but not their wives. They find themselves in the flesh, and yet they live not after the flesh, end of quote. That was revolutionary for that day. It's no wonder that those first Christians turned things right side up. They penetrated the world with an integrity that had not been seen before. We've heard a lot about integrity in this uh, presidential election time, uh, uh, about the need for it. Even people who were questioned with regard to how they voted were talking about how integrity mattered to them, how it was an important quality of life. It's that which is lacking today and needs to be uh, seen by those of, who are God's people, that we are people of integrity, that we can say things <coughs> and it's the truth and we live by those things that we say as well. A fresh dose of integrity flowing out from the lives of Christian men and women would literally change things even in our own day. Sometime back, there was an article in Time magazine uh, that dealt with the, uh, the embellishments and outright lies that were in people's resumes. Uh, John, I mean, Jeremiah McAward, who's president of a New York agency which investigates backgrounds of potential employees for various companies, made this statement, that of the thousands of resumes we investigate, there are outright lies on 22%. Seems like getting a job is more important than telling the truth. Advancement takes priority over integrity. But before we shake our heads at the perpetrators of deception, we need to bring the matter of integrity down to a personal level and ask our, uh, ourselves the question, do I tell the truth and, and, and am I living the truth in my relationships with others? Is this a part of my life? Is this important in my life? Do I see integrity? And the fact that when I speak, it's, it's known to be the truth. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no's be no's. Let it be that your life is that of integrity. And it should be an important quality of God's people. Several 30-something years, 30-something, isn't that how they call them, 30-somethings? Uh, went ladies were uh, sitting around a table playing bridge one day and in their conversation they began to elaborate on their affluence and one said my husband just purchased for me an expensive beautiful mink coat the minute I put it on though uh, I, 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 I began to sneeze I'm allergic to mink so I put it away the second one said that's nothing my husband just returned from New York where he purchased a designer's wardrobe for me but the minute I put it on I began to sneeze and I put the whole wardrobe in storage because I must be allergic to it. The third one announced, my husband uh, just bought me the most expensive Parisian perfume he could find. And when I opened the case, I nearly fainted, partly because he had bought it for me and mostly because the fragrance seemed to touch off a hidden allergy. At that point, the fourth lady got up and went to the bathroom quickly and returned looking pale. And they asked her what was wrong. She said, I don't know. I must be allergic to bologna. You know, there's a lot of baloney out there today, isn't it? <laughs> a lot of baloney going around these days. And it's happening in politics, at work, at home, even in the church. What's happened to the truth? What's happened to the fact that when somebody said something, you can believe them for what they say? That should be a priority in the life of everyone, but especially the life of those who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. 
The problem is not just what we say, but even what we do. How we live, is that consistent with what we say? Many times we set our sights on particular goals that we want to accomplish. And, and it seems that it doesn't matter how we get there. People use the phrase, the end justifies the means. If it helps me achieve what I'm looking forward to, or the goal that I have in mind, it doesn't matter, so many say, how I get the job accomplished just so it gets accomplished. But it does matter. What you do, how you live your life, is as important as what you say. Nothing in God's Word suggests that we can accomplish, un, that we can accomplish acceptable goals with unacceptable means and expect to be approved by God. Nothing in God's Word suggests that we can ignore the truth or avoid the truth or abuse the truth and expect fellowship with the one who is the truth. When we lose our integrity, we've lost it all. What will it take to turn the world right side up for Jesus? I believe it's going to take a recognition that there's something more important than money, something more important than success, something more important than popularity, something more important than recognition, something more important than power. It is integrity. Integrity not only in what we say, but also in how we live our lives. That was what those early Christians lived by. They were people of integrity. And they literally turned the world right side up for the Lord Jesus Christ. The second key ingredient is intensity. Intensity. We catch the spirit of that intensity in the words of James and John before the Sanhedrin found in Acts chapter 4. Where they said, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. We see it even more clearly in Paul's words to the Philippians when he said, Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, that intensity, forgetting what's behind, straining toward what's ahead. These first disciples turned the world right side up because they were very serious about the task that God had given them. That task of sharing the good news with a world in need. A world that needed forgiveness and, and, and could find hope and help in Jesus Christ. They had intensity. And it's that spirit of intensity, I believe, that, <coughs> excuse me, that we need to recapture in our churches today. We have many who, as the phrase in the Bible says, who are at ease in Zion. Many who have become complacent. We have many who've lost that intensity of being all that God wants you to be. How do you recapture intensity? I think it grows out of a conviction that nothing is more important than the expansion of the kingdom of God. Nothing is more important than that my family, my friends, my co-workers know Jesus Christ as their Savior. That we don't want anyone that we know to go out of this world without knowing Jesus Christ. And if they're going to find Christ as their Savior, it's not going to be by accident. It's going to be by my concern for them to the point that I do something about it in sharing my faith with them. That's the kind of intensity that it's going to take. About the early Anabaptist, one historian wrote, they knew nothing, sought nothing, desired nothing, loved nothing but God alone. The single focus on God and His kingdom is the source of of intensity and intensity is a key ingredient in the lives of those individuals who literally turn the world right side up for Jesus the third key ingredient is involvement involvement several years ago when Albert Schweitzer was in Africa 
a man who could, who could have stayed in Great Britain and made tons of money in his day. But he felt called of God to go to Africa and as a, a medical doctor, touch the lives of people there and invest his entire life in, in sharing there and he shared Christ with them as well. He was, he, he was a, a person who just literally made a difference in that world. At that same point, Jack Parr was the uh, late night uh, television host. He was the one who reigned back in those days before many of your times, I'm sure, but, but some of you remember him. But Parr made a statement that captured the spirit of our age, I believe. When he said, I'd like to be an Albert Schweitzer if I could commute. <laughs> and think about it. I'd like to be an Albert Schweitzer if I could commute. Go back and forth. You know, if you're really going to make a difference in the world, you've got to get involved, haven't you? Albert Schweitzer committed his life, dedicated his life to being where he felt God wanted him to be as a medical missionary, we'd call him. He was there sharing Christ and making a difference even with the medicine training, medicinal training that he had received. But you can't commute and make that difference. And there are a lot of people today who are not turning their world upside down for Christ because they don't want to get involved, don't want to do what it takes to share the message of Christ. What if Abraham would have said, leave Ur and go to a land that you'll show me? <laughs> Lord, I'd rather stay right here where I am and, and I know what I've got here. I, I'm not sure I want to go over there. I, I just don't want to get involved. Or what if Moses would have said, tell Pharaoh to let your people go, not me. <laughs> I, I don't want to get involved. Or what if David would have said, me, go and fight a giant? <laughs> I don't do giants. What if Isaiah in the temple, when God called him to go, when God said, whom shall I send and who will go for me? If Isaiah would have said, not me, Lord, let Jeremiah do it. I don't want to get involved. Or what if Paul on the Damascus road would have said, me, be a missionary to the Gentiles? I don't, I don't, like, mission, I don't like Gentiles. Besides, I don't want to get involved. What if the first disciples would have responded to the challenge of Christ like we do? Those who were threatened if they continued to tell others about Jesus. Those who were thrown in jail and told worse will come if you continue to speak about this one named Jesus. Would they have turned their world upside down for Christ? Would they have turned it up right side up for Christ? No. The key to their success was their willingness to follow the one who had changed their life and had called them to go and share that good news. And being obedient to him and serving him was more important than anything else. When they, when, as we read the scripture a moment ago, when Peter and John were, were, were questioned, said, don't tell anybody else. They said, look, what can we do except tell what we've seen and heard? We, we can't help but do it. It's got to be told, and, it, and we're the ones who saw it. We're the ones who heard him. We're the ones who have to share that good news. And we who have been changed by Jesus Christ, who know him as Savior and Lord of our own life, if he's truly changed your heart, you have a message to tell. Some people say, well, I don't know the scriptures like I, I, I feel like I need to know to go tell somebody about Jesus. You can tell, him, tell them what he's done for you. And if he hasn't done anything for you, maybe you need to be the one who needs to come to Christ. Because when Christ comes into your life, he forgives you of your sins and there's a new life in Christ, he said. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. There's a new experience of life. You see the world differently. Your thought patterns are different. What you want to do is different. Those early disciples could not help but be involved because they knew what Jesus had done for them and they knew he was coming back and they wanted everybody they knew to get to know Christ before it was too late. We need to have as our 
motto, if it is to be, it's up to me. It was a motto that Baptists had a few years ago. But it's that which we need to come back and, and reinvent or, or revitalize. Because nobody else can do what you can do. Nobody else can do what God's called upon you to do. And if it is to be, it's up to me and you to do what God wants us to do. I think the question we need to ask ourselves is if every member of the church were just like me, what kind of church would we have? If everybody was as faithful as I am, how many would we have in attendance as we gather? If everybody was as faithful in their giving as we have, how many days would we be able to have the lights on? If everybody was the kind of person I am in serving Christ, how many lost people would be coming to know Christ as their Savior? Because you see, it's really not us collectively, but it's you and me individually being faithful to God. It then measures back to the collectiveness, but it has to start individually. Where we are, if we're going to turn our world right side up for Jesus Christ, it's up to you and me to share with others what he means to us. It takes a life of integrity as well as believing what you've said, words as well as actions. It takes an intensity of doing it because it's not going to be done by accident. The devil's going to make sure you stay busy with so many things that it's just not going to happen unless you intentionally, with an intensity, get it done. And it takes being willing to get involved. Because, you see, you can't do it without involving yourselves in the lives of those for whom you're concerned. The question of the hour for our church, for every church, for everybody, is what kind of follower of Christ are we? We read some time back about a <clears throat> group of middle high uh, students who were preparing a Palm Sunday Passion Play uh, presentation. Rather than memorize a script, they decided to so immerse themselves in the scriptures about what happened uh, with the death and burial of Jesus Christ, that last, those last days of his life, that passion, as it's called, that they would just ad lib the, the state, the phrases, what they would say. The one who was playing Jesus, when he went off to pray that second time and then returned from praying and found those disciples asleep again after he had already wakened the first time, said, boy, they just don't make disciples like they used to, do they? Maybe that's a good way of putting it. Do they make them like they used to? See, those early disciples, they, they slept when Jesus asked them to stay awake in that garden. But following the resurrection of our Lord Jesus, they realized he's for real. He needs to be shared. He's given us the commission to go and tell the whole world about Jesus. It begins with one, it becomes two, and it begins to grow even as the choir sang a while ago. It begins with one box going out, and it's multiplied as thousands of boxes will go. In fact, millions will go around the world into the hands of people who need to receive the gospel of Jesus. Because in each box... Before it goes there will, uh, into those hands, there will be the message of Christ and his saving grace put in those boxes. A message about how to be saved. And when they go into those communities, into those villages, to give out these boxes, they will also share about Jesus. But we can't just let those who go there be the only ones because who's going to go to your friends? Who's going to be the one to go to your family members or those with whom you work or your neighbor? Who's going to go to those that you know who need Jesus? We're told that in the state of Louisiana, one out of every two people need Christ as their Savior. One out of two say they have no affiliation 
with a church or with, with God. That's in Louisiana, people. We're not talking about Africa here. We're talking about your neighbors and mine. That means when you stand in the checkout line, either the person in front of you or the person behind you, it, there's a great possibility that, that they're without Jesus Christ as their Savior. One out of every two, if they were to leave this world without Jesus, are going to miss heaven for eternity. Who's going to tell them? Who's going to let them know? If we're going to turn our world right side up for Jesus, it's going to take you and me living and saying, being a people of integrity who live lives with intensity, who are willing to get involved, or it's not going to happen. Yes, they said of those, look, these people are, have come and turned the world upside down. All that others might say of us, look what these people are doing in turning the world right side up for Jesus Christ. Would you bow with us in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we know that becoming a Christian doesn't just happen. It takes the knowledge that we're lost without you and we need you as our Savior. And it takes having heard the message about how to be saved, either from a friend or from a message spoken, or in some way, we, the message has to be shared before it can be listened to and then responded to. Help us to realize that we are your message bearers. Help us to see the world about us as truly needing to be turned right side up. Many have felt that because we have a new president elected that that's going to change things. But Lord, we know it's not going to change the world for Christ unless we who are your children do it. We can't depend on Washington to bring salvation to the hearts and lives of people. We do pray for our president and the president elect. We pray for those in Congress and in the Senate because we know they have a big job and there are a lot of needs in our country. A lot of things that do need changing. We need to move back to looking to you for leadership and for guidance. Lord, that which is really going to bring change in our world is your people living their lives for you, being committed to you. And if there's someone here this morning who's never made such a commitment, I pray that they'll realize that nothing's going to bring change until they truly just say, Lord, here am I. Save me. I want you to forgive me of my sins and come into my life and be my Savior. May we each look and hear that voice of your speaking and respond as you lead right now as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand to sing our hymn of invitation, as the Holy Spirit leads, we invite you to come. If there's a decision you need to make, you come. I'm here at the front to receive you as we sing. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonder. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His.
His glory and As we bow our heads in prayer together as Robbie still sings, would you let the Lord have His way in your heart right now? The most important decision a person will ever make is that of trusting Jesus as your Savior. But if you know Him, are you living for Him? Are you involved? Are you living a life of intensity? Are you living a life of integrity? That's important. In, even in our world, it seems to think it's not. Would you come right now? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for grateful for your presence this morning and pray that the Lord's going to give you a good day and that we'll see you back tonight at six o'clock as we continue our messages on the tabernacle and uh, hope you'll be with us tonight so uh, you see the outline there on the bottom you can come and get that filled in as we continue this some said last Sunday night with regard to the uh, the message that they had never heard a message about that portion of the the altar, the tabernacle, and all that was there. So I hope you'll be here. Uh, I'm enjoying preparing these and sharing because there's something special about what God did through the tabernacle that applies even to us today. But if you're a guest of ours today, thank you for coming. Hope you'll be back as well. Any and every opportunity God gives you to come be our way. Again, continue to pray for one another as we go from this place of worship. Let's bow together in prayer. Charlie Lee, would you lead us, please, sir?